Here's what's coming up on your horizon. Well, when it comes to our nation's food supply, we are a land of plenty. But has that abundance made us wasteful? Today, we give you some food for thought on what we throw away. We'll also examine some of the issues that could impact the cost of your next meal. We'll tell you why Oklahoma's waving waves of grain are getting a bit brighter. And I'll leave you with some thoughts on the benefits of being more grateful than wasteful. Stay with us for Oklahoma Horizon. Oklahoma Horizon is made possible by the Oklahoma Department of Career and Technology Education. Oklahoma's investment in career tech provides more than nationally recognized technology education and training. It produces solid financial returns for the state's economic future. Oklahoma Career Tech, elevating our economy. And the Oklahoma Department of Agriculture, Food, and Forestry, helping good people grow good things. And now, from the Career Tech Studios in Stillwater, here's your host, Rob McClendon. Hello everyone, thanks for joining us here on Horizon. We'll talk about irony. Thanksgiving, the holiday meant to commemorate when white settlers were saved from starvation by the generosity of Native Americans, is the single most wasteful day when it comes to the food we wind up throwing in the trash. We are a land of plenty. In fact, we produce so much food, much of it heads for export. But our resources, while vast, are still finite. And as the global population continues to expand, the key to feeding that hungry world may depend upon not just what we grow, but what we throw away. Well, as we sit down for this year's Thanksgiving dinner, probably the hardest decision most of us have to make is whether we want white or dark meat. We live in a country of such agricultural abundance that very little thought is given to the food that adorns our table once the meal is over. Estimates are Americans will toss a whopping 204 million pounds of uneaten turkey into the trash this Thanksgiving. And when you put pen to paper, that comes out to a cost of about $282 million of perfectly good food going to waste. So while our forefathers may have been grateful for the food before them on that first Thanksgiving, if we are to be judged by what we toss away, the same cannot be said today. So while such irony may be just a byproduct of our country's agricultural success, when you look at our planet's limited resources along with a rapidly growing population in the developing world, such outlandish wastefulness is not sustainable. Joining me now in the studio is the president of the American Meat Science Association, Dr. Brad Morgan. Thank you for being here. Thanks, Rob. So in terms of our food supply and our world population, what's the problem? The problem is, very, very honestly, we're, we're very uh, spoiled people in the United States. Whether you're talking about transportation or housing, or in this case, food, we're very wasteful. And uh, I think there's a lot of things that uh, are going to come up in the future. You know, by the year 2050, we're going to have 9 billion people on the planet. And, uh, and in case we haven't really thought about that, we're running out of land that we can farm and ranch on. So in the future, we're going to have to depend on using technology. In technology, we use that in the beef cattle industry. We use it in farming operations. And we're going to have to go ahead and use more and more of that in the future in order to provide food for those 9 billion people. Now, no way to discount those that may be suffering food, food insecurity. But if you do make a living wage in this country, food is typically both abundant and relatively cheap. On average, we spend about 7% of our disposable income to feed our families. Now compare Canada, for instance, who they actually make about the same amount of money that we do. They spend about 9%, and obviously the reason for that is their growing season is shorter. They have to bring in a lot of fruits and vegetables and have to import some different types of products. So it's going to be about 9% compared to our 7%. Now our friends to the south in Mexico, they spend about 25% of their disposable income on food. Now, obviously, they don't make as much money per capita as we do in the United States and Canada. So, again, they have to spend more. One of the things that you'll find out, though, is if you go over to Europe, for instance, they spend, depending on what country, anywhere from 15 all the way to 40% of their income 
is spent on trying to put food on their families' tables. And then our friends in Asia, Korea, Korea and Japan, for example, they'll spend anywhere from 15 to 20 percent of their income. So with most of these countries around the world that make the same amount of money that we do, they're going to spend anywhere from two to four times as much on food as we do here in the United States. So when it comes to food waste, can it be attributed to us just being careless with what seems like to be a very abundant resource? You know, we are very, very efficient in this country. We are very efficient at producing food. We're very efficient in, in harvesting it. We're very efficient in putting it into a truck and getting it down a major interstate to a distribution center or to a manufacturing facility. We're very efficient in getting it to the grocery store. We're very efficient to getting it to our, uh, to our houses. And more than in that, we're also very efficient in putting it in a trash can and pushing it to the curb and getting rid of any food waste or any scraps that we would have. So uh, our system is very efficient. In the United States, we do throw away about Believe it or not, about 3,000 pounds of food per second in the United States is what we throw away. And that's food that has been purchased at the grocery store or food that's been purchased at a restaurant. That does not even include the food that is wasted uh, in, the, in, the, uh, in the growing fields because the tomato was uh, small or it was irregular shaped or had a blemish on it. So we throw away about 1,400 calories per person per day in the United States uh, just on a daily basis. Throw it away and uh, that's, that's sort of a, sh a shame when you know that there's people in Oklahoma and around the world that are, uh, that are hungry. So could it be argued that this is just part of maybe a, a larger trend of our kind of a disposable society like you talked about? What's industry doing? Well, the industry, uh, we're finally standing up and saying, you know, we put too much work into this just to throw it away. And, and it's just not right uh, either. So what the industry is doing is this, is they're doing several things and it's really coming to a head very quickly. We are doing a lot of research, uh, the company that I work with, as well as uh, for instance at Oklahoma State University, in packaging systems. In other words, intelligent packaging systems. Things that can help you uh, manipulate and manage your inventory. So in other words, I know that crate of, uh, of uh, strawberries, it's been in, in the package for 14 days while this one has only been in the package for seven. And you have actually indicators now that say this one needs to be put out first. Or the other thing that may happen is that we have, uh, we used to all look for the coupons in the grocery, in the, in, the, in the Wednesday or the Sunday newspaper, and it was buy one, get one free. Well, there's companies now, grocery stores, for instance, Tesco in, in Europe, they're actually saying, you know what, we're going to give you a, 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 a buy one, get one free, but it's next time. So you buy a basket of strawberries, they print you out a coupon, and the next time you come into their stores, their store, we're going to give you a, a deal of, and it's, uh, of strawberries for free. So that second basket of uh, strawberries doesn't grow mold in my refrigerator. Doesn't grow mold, and the other thing it does is it gets you back into their store. So again, it, it's, it's good marketing, and it's saved them. They've actually saved about 20% uh, of the produce that they sell at Tesco's in Europe. They've saved it using this real simple concept of buy one, get one free next time. So what do you think this more sustainable world will look like? The state of Oklahoma, we have about three and a half million people that live in it. The country of South Korea, they have about half the land mass of the state of Oklahoma and they have 52 million people that live in half of Oklahoma in that country. So they don't have room to grow food. That's why their food is 15 to 20 percent of their income to buy it. More than that, they don't have landfills. So what happens now is, is you put your trash in Seoul, South Korea, uh, all of the disposable trash you put in a blue, a blue bag, and then all of the food waste you put it in a clear bag. And that clear bag you take to a specified dumpster and you open it up and you put it in there and ever, the more you put in, the more you're going to have to pay to get rid of your food waste. So you pay for it on the front end and you also pay for it on the back end. This has saved that country about $4 billion the first year. And it's just the right thing to do, you know, not throwing food away, good food. And, and it also helps you to try to manage your, your buying habits a little bit. So we're starting to see that same technology now in New York City and in San Francisco. So uh, it's starting to come to the United States as well, trying to help manage food waste in a lot of places where there's a lot of people and, uh, and, a, and a, not a lot of places to get rid of food waste. Well, certainly good food for thought for a, a day that... Uh or a week that we do waste a, a, a lot of food. All right, thank you so much, Brad. You're welcome. 
Well, Brad Morgan is with the Animal Pharmaceutical Company Zoetis, as well as serving as the president of the American Meat Science Association. When we return, the connection between being more grateful than wasteful. You're watching Oklahoma Horizon, featuring some of the good things that are happening in the great state of Oklahoma. Well, times are good down on the farm. Yes, we have suffered through a horrible drought, but for the most part, excluding some southwestern Oklahoma counties, farmers in the state have rebounded while enjoying record prices. But in a business where one has to be as mindful of the markets around the globe as the weather up above, there are some lingering issues out on the horizon that has those in the ag industry paying close attention. Here's our Andy Barth. Well, agriculture is a foundation industry for the state of Oklahoma, and for those who work the land, this past year was one of rebuilding. As a year of mostly cooperative weather and predominantly good crops come to a close, Oklahoma ag producers came together to look ahead. It's a good time. It's a good time to be in agriculture. Oklahoma Secretary of Agriculture Jim Reese says Oklahoma ag is back on the rise. Currently we're doing pretty well. You know, if you take the last uh, 20 years and pull out the last three, commodity prices have been close to double the previous 17 years. So uh, despite the drought, which, you know, certainly had a detrimental effect on, on agriculture, now we're, you know, we've had three pretty good years uh, economically for agriculture in Oklahoma. And while weather will always dictate agriculture success in Oklahoma, three other factors are increasingly impactful. Global demand, water, and workforce. Around the globe, a growing middle class is hungry for American food. Author and agricultural economist Jason Lusk. You know, one of the big ones is just more demand for food all the time, and that's coming often from countries like China and India. Uh, the food production is a world market, and, uh, and U.S. producers supply that world market. A big proportion of our agricultural production goes outside of this country. So the, the policy decisions we make here affect consumers all over the world. Decisions increasingly driven by the American consumer. A consumer that is often a dichotomy. Saying one thing while doing another. Once again, author Jason Lusk. I think here at home, uh, when you talk about consumers, you know, they're interested in all kinds of aspects of the food system, whether today it's organic or natural or local food systems. Uh, if you look at the actual market share for those kinds of foods, it's very low. So when you ask people about which things in the food system are most important to them, it tends to be uh, things like safety, price, nutrition, and convenience. So while today's farmer must be attuned to consumer demand, in some ways they're competing with those same largely urban consumers for a resource that is the lifeblood of agriculture, water. Most of us who live in suburbs or urban areas want to make sure we have uh, pretty lawns and, and uh, we don't think twice about flushing toilets and turning water on and off to get water or do our uh, dishes or do our laundry and it's a somewhat of a different perspective in the rural areas where every time you're turning water on you're usually doing it for a reason that's going to bring profitability to you. Larry Sanders is an OSU agricultural economics professor and says competition over water will continue between urban and rural communities. Right now we have more water than we need in the state, and that's likely going to continue. The basic issue is we need the water at a certain time, at a certain place, at a certain level of quality, and at a price we're willing to pay. Decisions being made in an aging population. The average age of the American farmer jumped from 51 in 1990 to 57 in 2010. And with fewer and fewer young people returning to the farm, older producers aren't sure who will continue feeding the world. Only 30% of small businesses are going to survive from the founding generation to the next generation, and that same statistic applies in agriculture. Oklahoma State University's Shannon Farrell. So if we really care about our farms staying intact and staying in our family and remaining viable, 
we've got to come up with a way to, to get around that statistic. And the, what the research suggests is that if we can help the next generation slowly grow into that role, gain experience, kind of gain ownership over time, rather than shifting everything all of a sudden when, when a generation passes away, we greatly increase our odds of success. Keith Kissling is a farmer in north central Oklahoma and says the public needs to know about what really happens down on the farm. We've got to tell our story better. I think that's the issue that we have. If we don't tell our story and what we're doing right, the public are not going to hear it. And so much of the time we just tell our story to the people that we know and we're, we're just preaching to the choir. But the number of farmers are shrinking. In 1920, 50% of Oklahomans were farmers. By 1950, it was down to 25%. And today, only 2.5% of Oklahomans work the land. And these numbers are even more dramatic on a national level. Want to share something you've seen here today? Well, all of our episodes are streaming on our YouTube channel at Oklahoma Horizon TV. Or you can subscribe to our weekly free podcast on iTunes. Well, Oklahoma has long been known for its golden waves of grain, but a developing industry in the state has some farmers' fields taking on a bit of a brighter palette. Elisa Hines explains. There's a new kid on the block. Its name, Canola. Rick Payne is a farmer in Thomas, Oklahoma, and says Canola is a nice fit in wheat country. It seems like our area is just so dry that we don't get we haven't in the past at least gotten very good results from summer crops without irrigation and so we really have embraced canola because it gives us a winter crop that allows us to rotate our wheat, keep our wheat ground more clean and to produce even better wheat I feel like. And the canola is just as uh, seem like is about the same profit margin as wheat is if not better. We're trying to plant a third of our crop acres to canola every year. And uh, this year we're going to try to get about just a little over 600 acres of canola and then we'll plant the rest of it to wheat. A winter rotational crop, canola really helps the soil. To me, it's a deep-rooted plant, especially in canola uh, grown on no-till. I believe it ha helps keep the soil more mellow and uh, keeps our soil loosened up where there's not as much chance of compaction. We try to graze uh, most of our wheat ground with cattle in the winter on just wheat pasture. And I feel like the canola kind of gives us the option of lessening the chance of having compacted soils just because of the way the root system works. I think the main benefit of canola, it not only improves our wheat yields, but it also uh, makes our wheat a lot cleaner crop. By keeping the weeds down, and how you plant can be just as important as what you plant. To me, this is a lot better. I think we need more down pressure right now. One thing that I'm excited about this year's canola over last year is last year we, of course, planted our canola no-till, but we planted directly into the wheat straw, just like we're doing now, where the wheat came, where we raised wheat here this past uh, spring. But this year we have a drill that has row cleaners on every other row and uh, we're not planting directly into the mat of chaff and straw in the wheat field. We have about a two inch little section where the row cleaners clean the straw out of the way. And so I'm excited about our stand and the viability of our canola withstanding freezes this go around as opposed to last year. We had a lot of freeze out damage last year and I'm hoping that this will be the solution for that. And you don't hardly see any dust behind this drill. While Rick knows what he's doing, raising canola. For many farmers, a little education is needed. That turned out to be ideal. Heath Sanders is with the Producers Cooperative Oil Mill in Oklahoma City and says they hope to grow the industry by educating farmers. We had great participation. I saw a lot of new faces that I'd never seen before. I've seen some veteran canola producers that had come to just learn more about production and, and what they can do to, to increase production. When we first started putting on these meetings, uh, we just didn't get near the attendance as we get today. And so uh, everybody's real excited about canola in Oklahoma and the Great Plains, and I think you're gonna continue to see that. Winter canola was brought in not to replace wheat, 
but to assist it. We're seeing better wheat yields. Uh, we're, we've got two crops coming off at once during the harvest. It's just a very good rotation with our wheat. It is the best rotation I've, I've ever seen. When you look at other crops and different things, just winter canola and winter wheat complement each other like corn and soybeans do uh, in the Midwest. Well, the challenge for uh, the, the farmers is it's a new crop. It requires a little bit different management techniques than wheat. And so it's all about, ag agriculture is very scientific these days. And it's all about proper management techniques and harvest techniques in order to maximize yields and maximize their bottom line. Our goal is to be extremely efficient with reception. We want to Neil Junkie is president of North Star Agri Industries and says because of the growth in the canola industry here in Oklahoma, <laughs> they're looking at building a canola oil processing plant in Enid. Canola is a, an oilseed crop. It's a high oil content crop with 40 to 42 percent oil and uh, it produces the healthiest vegetable oil on, on the market. It's been proven to be heart healthy and can reduce the risk of heart disease. So uh, it's a healthy product in growing demand in the U.S. and uh, winter canola has been uh, uh, proven to be an excellent crop in Oklahoma. Well, with the plant itself we'll be crushing 2,000 to 2,200 tons per day and so Canola produces about a ton per acre, so we'll be crushing the canola from about 2,000 acres per day at the plant. Uh, what we do is we produce two products, uh, food grade refined canola oil, like you see on the tables behind me, and canola meal. Canola meal is a high protein feed ingredient for cattle, particularly dairy cattle uh, do very well with canola meal. Brent Kissling is the executive director of the Enid Regional Development Alliance and says Enid is excited about the new processing plant. The canola crushing plant is a, uh, is a big deal for, for Enid, for Oklahoma, and for the agricultural industry in this area, uh, mainly because it's not just a plant that's coming in. It's really a new industry coming to this area. Oklahoma's been known for uh, forever for growing great commodities and then putting those commodities on a truck or on a train and sending them somewhere else for uh, somebody to add value to them. Um, with this announcement from uh, North Star Agri Industries to locate a, a, a processing facility here, we'll now be able to add value to that commodity and instead of selling a seed, we're selling canola meal and canola oil. And for producers like Rick? I'm looking forward to it. I do think that it will increase the canola price because uh, some of our canola are, for the most part, I think, had to be shipped to Kansas to uh, be crushed. And uh, if we could have that in Oklahoma, not only have uh, more jobs, but our product be used locally and uh, cut down on the freight. And I think, I just can't see, I think it's a win-win situation. I don't see anything negative about it. I'm excited about it. I hope that it comes soon. Locally grown, locally produced, and locally sold. And Elisa tells us construction of the North Star Canola Crushing Plant in Aided is scheduled to begin in 2015. You can keep up with us throughout the week. Just head to okhorizon.com where you can see more of any of our stories, read our reporters behind the scenes blogs, see what others are saying about us on Twitter, and face the facts with our regular updates. So reach out and touch us anywhere and anytime. Next time on Oklahoma Horizon, we look at the browning of America. We are still a very young population. Uh, a third of the, uh, the U.S. Hispanic community population is still under the age of 18 ha and has yet to enter the workforce. We're basically witnessing is a second version of a baby boom, if you will. Oklahoma's changing demographics on Oklahoma Show for the Heartland, Oklahoma Horizon. Well, it was early on in my career that I got to see firsthand something I remind myself of every time I get frustrated when I can't find something at my local grocer. I was in Leningrad in what is now St. Petersburg, Russia, when early one morning a line started developing around the corner from where I was staying. Now, later that evening, I asked a Russian friend what everyone was standing in line for. And his answer? Well, he didn't know and probably no one else did either. 
That's because in the old Soviet Union, shortages had become such commonplace that whenever a line began developing outside a store, people would naturally gravitate to it, knowing that there must be something good inside if others were standing in line for it. Now, no wonder that the highly controlled, centrally planned economy of the Soviet Union eventually crumbled from the dissatisfaction of everyday folks' lives having to be harder than they needed to be. Now, since that time, I have been to quite a few countries where food security is a constant problem, all of these in the developing world, which is why I get frustrated every time we do a segment on food insecurity in this country. We live in a land of such abundance that there is always enough food. Just for some, not enough means to afford it. Sure, poverty is often a symptom of a larger problem from a broken family to a chemical dependency. Yet the cause does not make the symptom any less painful. Unlike the famines we see in other parts of the world, here in this country, hunger stays in the shadows and its face is often that of a child. So as we sit down to give thanks in this land of plenty, let us remember the least of these, whose table may not look anything like our own. I'm Rob McClendon. Thanks for watching. See you back here next week. Horizon is made possible by the Oklahoma Department of Career and Technology Education and the Oklahoma Department of Agriculture, Food, and Forestry. Thank you for watching Oklahoma Horizon.